the truth is out there. It is one of the world's greatest mysteries, Scotland's legendary Loch Ness Monster. So does the lake creature actually exist? Well, if you ask one man, he'll tell you it is in fact no myth. Every day it's flaunted in front of your face. Hundreds of people in the valley say they are hearing voices in their heads. You just choose to ignore it. Belief can be a powerful force. No one knows that better than the people who are sure they've seen Bigfoot. Real accounts. He says he knows who's playing mind games. Rogue government officials that are uh, sponsoring this. Um, also corrupt business officials and um, private citizens. From real people. Hundreds of people turned out tonight for the unveiling of a very controversial statue. Yeah, it really is. The Satanic Temple of Detroit revealed the one-ton bronze statue. It's time for you to take a swim. I'm just excited to see my Lord and Savior Baphomet represented in such glorious Italian stone. I do hope his eyes gaze upon me and that my allegiance is recognized. In the dark waters. The Dark Waters Channel is for entertainment purposes only. Although information in these stories can be traced back to relevant and true sources, Dark Waters strongly discourages its viewers, listeners, and subscribers from visiting the sites of incidents and encounters discussed or revealed on this show. In other words, I will not be held responsible if you are attacked by dogmen, molested by Bigfoot, bitten by vampires, chased by chupacabras, abducted by aliens, accosted by the men in black, investigated or arrested by local law enforcement, CIA, FBI, NSA, EPA, BLM, or any other alphabet group, whether on U.S. soil or abroad. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the show. On this installment of the Dark Horses Channel, we present to you 10 true horror stories from the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. These 10 true horror stories were handpicked to take you on a journey into the darkness that descended upon the city of New Orleans during and after Hurricane Katrina. These stories will challenge you mentally, spiritually and emotionally, allowing you to live the events of those dark days. The Dark Waters Channel now presents 10 Hurricane Katrina stories, part one, featuring Mr. X Dreams. We were staged in the Gulf of Mexico on an aircraft carrier when I initially arrived to Louisiana. My job was to escort a priest, Father Michael, into the city so that he could administer the last rites to the multitudes of dead that were being found in the city of New Orleans. You see, the Archdiocese of New Orleans was completely wiped out. So priests were being flown in from across the United States to help with the deceased and pray for survivors. We took off just before sunrise, headed into New Orleans. As we got closer to the city, Father Michael began to squirm and twist in his seat as if he was uncomfortable inside his own skin. He clutched to his silver crucifix in his hand so hard that his knuckles began to turn white. Then he slowly started to mumble, take, take me back. I can't go any further, take me back. Father Michael quickly reached over one of the soldiers and tried to open the door to the helicopter while we were in midair. For that, he received the elbow in the chest accompanied by an evil look. He retreated and sat there between the two armed men with tears in his eyes. Then Father Michael began to break down. Please turn around. Please turn his helicopter around. Can you feel it? He stared out of the window as he spoke. I can feel the evil in this city pulling at my soul. There's a darkness here. The devil and his children are deep at work. Take me back, please. There is pure evil here. Please take me back. None of us had ever seen a man of the cloth react in such a way. It was spooky and frightening at the same time. But the priest was serious. So we turned the helicopter around and took him back to the aircraft carrier. After speaking with his boss, the head priest, we all boarded the helicopter again and headed back to the city. The ride back was full of laughs. I must admit, we did tease Father Michael a bit. But when we landed, I quickly realized that what he said was the truth. The stuff that was happening in New Orleans was pure evil.
At the time of Hurricane Katrina, I held a management position at the Hyatt Hotel in downtown New Orleans. The hotel is adjacent to the Superdome, where many of the people were held for over a week until they were evacuated. Contrary to popular belief, the levees didn't break during the storm. It was the morning after that the water came rushing into the city. The stories I'm going to share with you are not for the faint of heart, and if you are easily offended you should stop listening now. I was not aware of what was being shown on TV while the city was flooded. We were too busy dealing with people trying to find safety. However, I do remember when the military contractors arrived. These men and women were something straight out of a movie. Hardcore, combat tested, killing machines. We had been having a problem in the hotel with a man molesting and raping women while they were sleeping. He was breaking into rooms and doing some of the most horrible things you could imagine. The Hyatt had backup generators for the first few days of the storm that allowed people to move about with some light, but once they failed because of lack of fuel, things went straight to hell. Every hallway was dark, and the stairwells were deadly. The contractors searched the hotel floor by floor and room by room until they found it. Once he was identified by two of the victims, he was walked out of the side access door and we never saw him again. I won't say that they killed him, but the chances that he ran away were very slim. That same day, I went along with three of them to Gentilly, a section of the city where my house was. I wanted to see if I could salvage anything from my place, relatively safe and isolated from the horrors of the outdoor and the hotel. I had absolutely no idea of the real condition of the city. We had only made it about a mile in the boat when we ran into the first dead body, a young child floating in the water, no more than twelve years old. His body was bloated and swollen from the gases inside. A chunk of his leg was missing from some type of animal bite. On the rooftops were people everywhere begging for help. One man was standing on his roof pointing to the water. Sharks! Sharks! He shouted. When I looked over I saw three sharks swimming down the street. We traveled further. The sounds of people asking for help to this day still torture me. A woman on the roof cried out, Help! My baby is sick. Just take him with you. The contractors looked at me, saying it was my decision. What was I supposed to do with a baby? I could barely feed myself. I decided to ignore her. We were passing the prison when we saw two men with guns elevated on the steps of the courthouse. They crouched down to hide, I guess expecting to ambush us and take the boat. The guys I was with simply lit the area up with gunfire. No questions, no second thoughts. For three minutes straight they lit up the area. I saw the men scramble away jumping from the steps into the water and we sped past them in the boat. At that time, I was completely over the idea of going to my house. Screw that. We arrived at Broad Street to find bloated dead bodies floating around everywhere. The smell was nauseating. I had seen enough. I began to wonder how many people did I know that were floating around the streets, and I asked to go back. When we arrived at the hotel, I could only sit there. I cannot tell you the words to describe how the city felt the smell of chemicals and death. Many people claim to know what disaster is, but until you live through something like that, you have no clue. Wait, there is one more story I would like to share with you from my time stranded at the hotel. Nighttime was the worst for everyone. We all tend to take for granted the simple things in life, like food, clean water, and working lights however it's the life that makes you feel safe if you find yourself without life for an extended period of time everything becomes frightening imagine this the day after I ventured out with the team of contractors rumors began to spread about the things happening at the Superdome which was less than one block away from the hotel now rumors doing a disaster, as I would learn later that night, should be treated as actual facts. 
See, you have no way of knowing what's true and what's not true. We got word that there were gangs of men roaming the area of the Superdome with guns. A little unknown secret was that ammunition was scarce during Katrina. Somehow, the criminals had managed to get much more ammunition than the National Guard soldiers that were there. Word was that they were going to come to the hotel and try and occupy the rooms. And this occupation was going to happen by force. So far, I have neglected to explain some things to you. You see, one face of the hotel was littered with broken windows. This was the side of the hotel that faced the corner of Porgers and Loyola Avenue, the east side. The western side did not have as much damage as there were other buildings to shelter the windows from the wind. So essentially, the eastern wing of the hotel was completely unsecured and could easily be infiltrated if a person desired to. I had to meet with several of the contractors who stayed in the hotel and asked that they patrol the eastern section. They agreed to leave two men behind to patrol the bottom two floors of the eastern section. That night, things were very quiet in the hotel. So quiet that it made me very nervous. The majority of the contractors had gone out into the night to do what they were hired to do. I choose not to share that information as I prefer not to get shot. However, there were supposed to be at least two men patrolling the eastern corridors. And of course, it was my job to check on them and see if they needed anything. So I mustered all the courage I could, grabbed my 9mm and headed over to that section of the hotel. It was 11.47 p.m. I will never forget the time because the glow of my digital watch was the only thing that provided me any light to see by. Walking the dark halls of the eastern wing of the hotel was one of the most frightening things I had done in my life. The hotel had thousands of broken windows and the wind blew through them creating this constant low moaning and whistling sound. That combined with the flapping of the curtains in the windows left me completely unnerved. In the hallway, the majority of the doors were closed, but towards the end of the hall, I knew at least one or two of them were open. I could feel a strong breeze blowing through the hallway as it created a tunneling effect, the air pushing against my chest. Halfway down the hall, I heard one of the doors open. Again, with no light other than that from my digital watch, I began to freak out. Was it one of the contractors or someone else? Man. To be real with you, I was not just scared, I was terrified. The funny thing is when you're truly scared, you forget that you have a weapon. The 9mm I had with me might as well have been a loaf of bread at that point. Somehow, I pressed on, not wanting to say anything and alert the possible bad guys to my presence or accidentally get shot by the contractors, I just walked slowly to the end of the hall. When I got to the stairwell door, Something told me, look behind me. I turned my head, and through the darkness, I could make out three silhouettes slowly moving down the hallway towards me. It was not the contractors for sure. It's only two of them. Panicking, I quickly pushed open the door to the stairwell, and the sound it made was this loud creaking and squeaking noise. I knew at that moment I had given my position away. So I bolted up the steps, to the second floor, out the door, and into the hallway. Sprinting down the hallway as fast as I could, I saw a blinding light come from ahead of me. In such darkness, that kind of light is disturbing. Then it went off. What you running for, G? Asked one of the contractors. Breathing heavily, I managed to say, Chased. First floor. Intruders. He whistled, and there was a reply from both ends of the hallway. Then he said, if shit goes left, keep your head down and get into one of the rooms. By now, you can hear movement coming from the stairwell that I had just exited, followed by the door slowly opening. The next few seconds were quiet as the dog figures made their way out of the door and into the hallway. I couldn't make out everything they said, but for sure I heard them say, we gonna find that motherfucker. After that, things erupted. 
the guy in front of me turned on the tactical light he had on his gun and lit up the hallway. There were four men, two with assault rifles and two had machetes. Then the contractor said something that scared the shit out of me. He looked at him and said, you can drop the weapon and leave. I'll walk you out. But if you don't want to walk out, we can carry you out in pieces. Legs, arms, head, hands, and torso. The words flowed out of his mouth like he was ordering coffee from Starbucks. I'm not sure if I caused what happened next. But out of fear, I opened the door to the room in an attempt to get out of the way. Then there were gunshots. I'm not sure if any of you have ever heard gunfire in a closed space like a hallway, but it's loud. Deafeningly loud. But this gunfire was nothing like the gunfire on a boat. It wasn't wild and crazy. It was two successive shots. And then there was a pause. And then two more. And then two more. Inside the room, my ears were ringing so loud that it hurt. When I looked out into the hallway, the two men with the rifles were dead. And the other two men were on their knees. What are you about to do, I asked. Contractor replied, nothing. We just gonna have a talk. Then we gonna let them go so they can deliver a message to the rest of their friends. One of the men that they had on his knees had very long dreadlocks. They asked him if anyone else was in the building. For some reason, he decided to act hard and pretended he didn't hear them. That's when they grabbed a single lock of his hair, ripping it from his skull, causing his scalp to bleed and blood to run down his face as he cried out in pain. Then they asked him again, do you have anybody else here with you? He mumbled, no, no, there's no one else. They stood both of them up and said, we're letting you go. So you can spread the word that the people in this hotel are protected. And if the rest of your boys come here, they will be killed. Two men scrambled away out of the door and down the steps. That was my first and last time checking the east side of the hotel. The following day, the rumor mill was in full steam about the white boys at the Hyatt killing people. That story was spread far and wide, but I was there, and I know the real deal. It was not about black and white. If it was not for those contractors, I'd have been dead that night. seven days before Hurricane Katrina when I saw something so freaky that I quit my job. At the time, I was working for a man they called Little Phil Rosito at the Jester Daiquiri shop on Bourbon Street. Every building on Bourbon Street has its ghosts, shadow people, and demons. It was about 2.30 p.m. on a Thursday. The streets were semi-packed with drunken tourists. They were all talking about the hurricane headed to New Orleans bombarding me with the stupidest questions. Is the city really a bowl? How tall are the levees? Looking past this group of drunken pikers, I saw what looked like a huge shadow moved past the front door of the building. There's no mistaking what I saw. The building has huge doors that are always open. I quickly ran around the bar headed for the door. That's when I saw a second, very large shadow pass by. Peeping my head out looking down Bourbon Street, I could see two large shadow figures, at least 15 to 17 feet tall, shaped like men. The people on the street reacted to the shadows as they moved down the second block of Bourbon Street and disappeared into the walls of one of the strip clubs. I've been told by the other bartender about the shadow people in the buildings around Bourbon Street, but that was just too much for me to handle. I told my boss, Little Phil, what I saw. He checked out the tapes and there they were, two big shadows walking down Bourbon Street in the middle of the day. Little Phil just laughed it off and said, well, it is New Orleans.
As for our conversation at NDA, here's the story that we discussed. As I revealed to you, I work as a remote viewer for the United States government for many years. I decided to retire from my service to our country when there were some things that I did not agree with as a patriot of the United States. Before I tell you this story, let me explain what remote viewing is and what it is not. It's not hocus pocus magic. It is channeling of psychic energy to locate a target anywhere. By anywhere, I mean any location known and unknown to man. This story is about a private case that I was paid to consult on here in New Orleans. Ahead of time, I would like to say that the details of this case cannot be shared, but what I saw during the viewing can be. A young woman went missing on Bourbon Street two days before Hurricane Katrina hit. Local and state law enforcement were in no position to locate this VIP. This young lady was from a prominent DC family, so when I received a call, I knew no expense would be spared in trying to locate her. Initially, I was unable to find anything, but after a few minutes, my mind began to get some images that were very disturbing. These images I received were not like a movie, but more like still pictures that flash in my mind. The first thing I saw was a wooded area with a large hole in the ground with smoke billowing out of it. Then a set of tracks leading deep into this underground hole. Images of a man unnaturally large and tall with his back turned to me standing at a table. His attire was old and fashioned and he was wearing some type of apron which was tied behind his neck and waist. The next image I saw was the table long and wide, covered in blood, and would look like the intestines of a person or animal. I couldn't really tell. In his hand was a cleaver, but not a standard kitchen cleaver. This was four feet long with a wooden handle wrapped in gray duct tape. His hand rested on the table with the cleaver in his clutches. Then, for the first time ever, in all my years of doing this work, an image flashed in my mind of him looking directly at me. The entire time I was in his environment in the underground area, but this image was at my house. I'm standing there before me looking directly at me. I immediately ended this <laughs> session and got up, had a glass of scotch, smoked a cigar to relax. This was confusing to me. One, where was the girl? Two, where the hell was this place? Three, how did he know I was looking at him? In my profession, the target is always unaware of you seeing them but he was actually aware and projected himself into my environment. This man, this man was evil and possibly psychic. An hour later, after I rested, I focused on the girl again and found myself in the same place. Images of the table, the cleaver, but she was nowhere and neither was he. Images of chains hanging from the ceiling with shackles. A pool of blood on the floor beneath them. Then a table. An image of a table. It was neat and well kept. Not a speck of dust or blood or anything. With a set of keys. And a dog collar with the name Zeus and an address in southwest Louisiana. The information was given to the state troopers. They found a house near the bayou, and inside was the most terrifying thing they had ever seen. A table with severed female body parts, hands, legs, arms. The missing girl's head was found, but nothing else. Outside in the back of the property, they found a small boat dock that extended into the wetlands, and a shack. The police surmised that he was feeding the body parts to alligators in the marsh. 
This is one of the most horrific remote viewing sessions I've ever done. As for the man, they caught him. He was at the vet with his dog Zeus. The trooper I spoke with said that he was 6 feet 10 inches and 345 pounds. He was a true freak of nature. When the storm hit, I was at home in Michoud, a small suburb outside of New Orleans. The waters came in so quickly that my husband and I were forced to move up the stairs only 10 minutes after we first saw the water on the streets. He was freaking out and grabbing food, guns and ammunition while I stood on the stairs screaming and having a panic attack. The sound of water rushing down the streets was deafening. We thought we would be safe, but it kept getting higher and higher until we were forced to climb into the attic of the house. The thing I remember most was the smell of the water and the humidity and heat of the attic. My husband began to shoot holes in the roof with his shotgun to let fresh air into the small space, and after opening a hole large enough, we climbed out onto the roof. Looking out, it was a sea of destruction, cars floating into houses, dead bodies were everywhere. If that was not scary enough, when night came, you could feel the evil and death in the air. Our neighbor from around the corner, Quinn Nguyen, had a boat and passed by saying he was going to Walmart in search for food. He had no weapon and asked my husband to join him. Instead, he gave him one of his shotguns and we watched him move off into the darkness. Throughout the night, gunshots could be heard, along with yells and screams. But there was one scream that stood out above the rest. It was unnatural and didn't sound human. The sound made the hair stand up on the back of my neck, and my husband didn't sleep that first night. The next morning, Quinn came back with some bottles of water, cookies, brownies, canned tuna, and pickles. He climbed onto the roof and told us about the madness that was going on, the death, the murders he saw at the Walmart. He said he saw a woman who was walking on the water, in all gray. Her face was deformed, long white hair, and her breasts were sagging and exposed through her dress. She was outside of the Walmart screaming and wailing, with the most awful sound he had ever heard. He said he stayed in the store the entire night along with 50 other people who were afraid to leave. That night, I would witness this for myself, firsthand. I can't tell you what time it was for sure, but it was well after sunset. People were on their roofs, shouting at each other. The sounds of Quinn's crank radio were so refreshing as it broke the silence and provided a small sense of normality. Then, above the talking and the radio, I heard the scream the same scream that chilled my body the night before, and everything and everyone went silent. It was close, way closer than the previous night, and getting even closer. Looking out into the street, I could see a figure, barely visible by the light of the moon. It was moving above the surface of the water, not walking, more like gliding. Then the screams began again. My husband pulled me back down to the attic. We huddled there like two children who had just awakened from a nightmare. What was that? How was it able to move over the water? Why was it screaming? The sound still haunts me to this day. During Hurricane Katrina, I worked search and rescue. To this day, I don't regret going to New Orleans to help the citizens of the United States of America. But what I experienced has stained me. Once your eyes have been opened to the true evil of this world, you are never the same person again. My name is Chico. And the two stories that I will share with you are only two of many. In the days after Hurricane Katrina, my job was to search for and rescue survivors. Myself, and two other SAR officers were assigned an airboat. Airboats were used because they allowed travel on water and for short distances on land. Another advantage of the airboat was that there was no propeller in the water to get caught on debris, leaving you stranded. I have conducted search and rescue operations all over the world, but what I saw in New Orleans, I have never seen anywhere before. I arrived into the city via helicopter. 
and was taken to the staging area where multiple crews worked 12 to 15 hour shifts searching for survivors. All shifts began at 11 p.m. and myself and two other SAR officers departed the staging area in the Lord Knife Ward praying that we will find people alive. There are no words strong enough to verbally describe the destruction that besieged the city of New Orleans. As we ventured out, the flood waters were 12 feet high, littered with debris of all types, large and small. Navigating the area was beyond difficult. There were shipping containers, boats, cars, and even houses floating through what used to be the streets of New Orleans. The dead bodies of men, women, and children were everywhere. Survivors were clinging on to anything that they could to stay afloat. That night, as we rescued a woman, she told us we needed to start checking refrigerators and freezers because people were using them as life rafts. Hours later, just before sunrise, we spotted a refrigerator lodged between two cars. There were legs hanging out of it, with the lid closed on top of them. Approaching this refrigerator, I just knew the person inside was dead. We had found three times more dead people than alive, and I was preparing myself for the worst. When I lifted the lid, there was a man inside, drinking a bottle of water. He smiled and said, thank God you found me. As we pulled him onto the boat, his eyes darted left and right. Then he pointed to a deep freezer that was floating alongside one of the houses and said, hey, check that freezer. Yesterday there were three kids inside. I could hear them talking, but last night they went silent. Maybe they got out. We hurried over to the deep freezer and I reached down and opened the lid. The contents still haunt me to this day. Inside there were three little boys. They were between six and 12 years old, all dead. The lid must have closed on them overnight and it suffocated to death. That was a terrible moment for me personally, as I remember seeing that deep freezer two times. I never once thought to check inside. I will never forget how the events around Hurricane Katrina affected my life. I worked for a tow truck company that had roadside assistance contracts with both State Farm Insurance and Allstate. In 2005, I lived in Beaumont, Texas. We were receiving calls for everything from flat tires to cars that ran out of gas. It was 24 hours before the storm was set to land when I was called out to the area of Deweyville, a city that sits on the Texas and Louisiana state line. The dispatcher said that the people had gotten off I-10 to avoid traffic and ran out of gas on Louisiana 12, near Sabine River. It was a 30-minute ride from my last call, and it was going to get dark soon, so I floored it and arrived in the area well before sundown. I crossed the two-lane bridge on Louisiana 12, searching for their vehicle, a red Nissan Sentra. The dispatcher clearly said they had gas trouble, and that they were within one mile of the bridge. I found the car 300 yards away from the Texas border, but no one was inside. Deciding to take a look on foot, I found tracks leading from the passenger side door going north into the woods. Thirty feet into the wood line, I was able to pick up a second footprint, a men's tennis shoe. I started to get a very bad feeling. My heart was feeling this pressure that I'd never felt before, but I kept looking 200 and 300 feet deeper into the woods. I found two sets of clothes, both folded neatly on top of a tree stump. The tracks moved from that point, 20 feet north toward the river, and then stopped. Confused. I got back to my truck and radioed the dispatcher and told her to contact the police and report them missing. I'm so ashamed to admit that I never really followed up on what happened to those people. It was a stressful time. There really is no good excuse for it. I regret the decision I made not to do more to look for these people, but something was wrong, very wrong that day. Truthfully, I was scared.
One of the most overlooked aspects of Hurricane Katrina was the evacuation process before the storm hit. My family left New Orleans two days before the storm landed, and it took 24 hours before we were able to get to Houston, Texas. The traffic was horrific. Millions of people in their cars on the road, trying to get away. That is the background of my encounter. We were on the road outside of Slidell, Louisiana. I was 12 years old, and after hours in traffic I had to pee. Since we were in a bushy area, my father decided to stop the car and let me pee in the bushes. I got out and walked away from the car, maybe about 15 feet into the bushes. Then I started to relieve myself. I felt a fear I've never felt since. I had the distinct sense that I was being watched. I looked at a certain bush which had long grass, and I could see glowing yellow eyes looking back at me. As I looked at the eyes, a creature stood up to reveal that it was taller than the long grass. I didn't really see what the body looked like, but I could see the outline of its head. It had pointy ears in the shape of a German Shepherd's. I quickly ran back to the car, peeing myself a little and jumped onto my mother's lap. She asked me what was wrong, but I didn't say anything. Clearly no one in the car saw what I saw. I decided to keep my mouth shut. It was years later as I was watching a movie called Dog Soldiers that I finally recognized what I saw. I asked a workmate of mine, who grew up in the area about such things, and he told me of legends of some sort of creature with the head of a wolf. I was saved from the roof of my house on the fourth day after Katrina hit, placed on a bus and shipped to Nashville, Tennessee, where the wonderful people of that city embraced me. I was given an apartment to stay in rent free for six months to allow me time to get back on my feet and start working again. The apartment was extremely nice and nestled along the Cumberland River. This was the first time I had ever stayed outside of the city of New Orleans for any serious length of time and definitely the first time I lived among such a diverse group of people. That's the background of my encounter. I'm in Nashville, in an upper middle class white neighborhood. What stood out to me is the number of children who played at the park across the street from my apartment. The sound of kids that play was something I was very familiar with, but these kids sounded much more happy than the ones back home in New Orleans. Saturday evenings were always lively. The sounds of kids playing it was almost overwhelming, but in a good way. There was a knock at my door, which I figured was the maintenance man who was supposed to come install a new dishwasher. I opened the door, not thinking or really paying attention, and said, hey, come on in. Walking from the door into the kitchen, I got a feeling. You know the feeling you get when your body tells you something is wrong? Hair standing on the back of your neck, chills down your spine, hands trembling. It was worse than that. This was a sensation of fear. Primal fear. All of a sudden, I wanted to run and hide, and everything inside of me said, don't turn around. But I had to. I had to look and see what was scanning me like this. Imagine my surprise when I turned to see a little girl at my door. Blue jeans and a Gap t-shirt her head down, and hair covering her face. For a second, I felt relieved and safe. I said, hey darling, you okay? Now 10 feet away from her, with the front door still open, she raised her head, displaying her face and eyes. Her face was pale, this pale grayish white color, and her eyes were black, completely black. What had I just invited into my house? The look of those solid black eyes were like nothing I've ever seen. As I was thinking to move to slam the door in her face, she smiled, almost as if she could read my mind. She stepped into the apartment, closing the door behind her. This was all too much for my brain to process, and I fainted. When I woke, 
I was still on the kitchen floor and it was dark outside. Initially, I thought it was a dream, but I felt sick and there was a harsh smell in the apartment, like sulfur. I pulled myself off of the floor and searched the apartment. Thought to myself, what the fuck? Confused, decided to take a shower and try and figure out what the hell just happened. The shower didn't help me relax. Actually, my blood felt like it was beginning to boil inside of me. And even though I was in the shower, my skin had this nauseating odor that reminded me of old pennies. The sickening feeling began to make my body weary, so I decided to call it a night. I was jolted out of my sleep by an unnerving feeling. My eyes were still blurry. I was still a bit disoriented in the darkness of my unlit room. I looked over at a digital clock to see what time it was. I could barely make out the time. 3 a.m. As I tried to gather my bearings, I noticed a black silhouette at the door of my room. Who was it? Was I dreaming? My questions were answered immediately when I made eye contact with the little girl as she approached the foot of my bed. Her eyes like two black holes sunk deep into her head. She smiled as she reached out, touching my foot, and then disappeared before my eyes. Since that night, I have been in and out of the hospital with various illness. My apartment began to experience strange paranormal activity. Things like objects being moved, doors opening on their own, and the reappearance of the black-eyed girl sitting on the floor watching TV. My most recent diagnosis is necrosis of the foot. And yes, it's the same foot that she touched. Wow, okay guys, that was um, 10 horrific and horrifying stories from Hurricane Katrina. This is your host and the driver of the Dog Waters channel, Dog Waters himself. And I want to start off this inside baseball section by session by telling you thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys know how appreciative I am of you. And if you don't know, I want to tell you again, I really, really appreciate each and every one of you listening each and every one of you commenting and i really appreciate how you guys share my videos and spread the word so i just want to say thank you um a little small thing that you don't know is you know i, I think it's against the rules to share what you make on youtube but all i will say is thanks to you guys listening i was able to buy some groceries from my youtube money and that's awesome i mean when i say that's awesome that's awesome um so I really appreciate you so just keep doing what you're doing and i'll keep doing what i'm doing now i realize something is that i need to address the new subscribers because every day we're getting somebody new so to the new subscribers welcome to the dog waters family <clears throat> you will find here something very different than any other horror channel um number one thing is uh i my videos are super duper high quality so i'm not the kind of guy who spits out video after video after video after video of garbage because I'm chasing views I'm chasing quality um, subscribers that will ride with me and stick with me for the long term so if you're in it to win it and you want to be around and you want to hear the best quality that continues to get better and better then stick with me here at the dog waters channel because I'm going to put out phenomenal content every time no backing down no turning away it's going to be top-notch <clears throat> and you better take my videos and compare them against anybody else's videos and you will be able to, uh, to tell a difference. So I want to say thank you for subscribing um, and welcome you to the Dog Waters family. And just thanks for being here. So this video was um, was a collaboration with Mr. X Dreams. And let's talk about Mr. X Dreams for a second. As you guys know, and as you long-term listeners know, I've reached out to multiple um, 